All right. I think uh, we're at the top of the hour on my time, although not not maybe the same as the live timer here. But uh, you know, I think it's a good time to probably get started. So um, let's just jump right in. And again, for everybody here, my first time with StreamYard, so bear with me on any technical difficulties and bouncing back and forth between the windows here. Um, but without further ado, let's jump right into it. So, uh, you know, certainly good afternoon, good morning, depending on, on where you're based uh, uh, today. Uh, my name is uh, Dion Pico. I'm the VP of product uh, for Acquia Marketing Cloud. And I joined Acquia about three months ago. I'm, uh, I'm enormously impressed by, you know, Acquia's efforts uh, throughout throughout really its, its company's history to really, you know, build and foster communities and Really excited about the Mata community. Uh, you know, interested. Uh, loved loved the sessions I'm able to see today. Really interested to meet and work with more of you in the Mata community, uh, and to really develop a much more you know close working relationship moving forward. Uh, so so real excited on that front. Um, and, and certainly, while well, today is an introduction for me, um, you know, very much looking forward, as I said, to connecting with you understanding uh, areas where you're working on, how we can collaborate better uh, and really amplify each other's works moving forward as well. So for, for those of you out there in the community, uh, my email is uh, dion.pico at acquia.com. Uh, and I'd encourage you, you know, reach out to me. I'd love to set up some time and, and certainly dive deeper into what you see and, and you know, kind of, like I said, areas we can work together and collaborate a lot more strongly moving forward. Uh, Julie, why don't you introduce yourself as well before I hog all the uh, hog all the time here? Sure, I'm Julie McAvini. Um, I'm a senior product manager on the marketing cloud team, working under Dion. Um, I've been with Acquia for about a year and a half now, and I joined the Modic team about four months after joining Acquia. I've been really excited to work with the community and excited to continue working with the community, especially on our roadmap. Um, and you know, as Dia mentioned, you can also feel free to reach out to me um, whenever you have questions or comments or if you want to chat about anything. My email is julie.macavini at uh, aquia.com. Excellent, and you have uh, you know good good uh, closing segue here, I believe, where folks will also have some regular scheduled time. So we'll get exactly. to that in a second as well. Um, in terms of agenda for today, let me just get the slides moving forward here. Really want to look at a few things. Um, one, just uh, a little bit of an education, and I, I purposely I want to avoid selling, so so I'm not trying to sell anybody anything, but I think it's it's worthwhile just to kind of level set on. You know, Acquia, Modic, for those of you who, who may not know. Also, you know, good chance for me to kind of elaborate, uh, you know, what I've seen over the last couple of months as well. But really talk about Modic's role inside of Acquia's marketing cloud portfolio, what that means. Um, talk a, bit, a little bit around some observations Julie and I have seen from working with uh, some larger enterprise customers, which is, uh, you know, I'll talk about more about in a second. We also want to talk about what our roadmap is and, and potential areas that we can align with the Modic community around that and really foster some more, uh, um, you know, both community alignment and, as I said, amplifying each other's work and, and amplifying the value to each other. And, and then talk about what's coming next uh, in terms of, uh, you know, both our roadmap as well as areas of, of, you know, collaboration that I think would be good to touch on as well. Um, we've purposely tried to minimize the amount of slideware here and really not try to, uh, you know, have folks sit, sit through just us speaking to you and really trying to leave a lot of time towards the end of this session to, to get your comments, to get your questions, feedback, you know, wh whatever makes sense. So, you know, I want to encourage you all to uh, hopefully make the best use of this time or, you know, leave us with some interesting observations and thoughts yourself, which would be, uh, you know, certainly high value for us. And I think high value for the community at large. So that's what we're going to run through today. Um, as I said, large portion really dedicated to Q&A towards the end as well. So let me kick things off here. I, I really wanted to talk at, at a high level of, of where, where it fits within the portfolio, certainly, where Modic fits and its importance within the portfolio. Um, I'll back up and just talk a little bit around what Acquia does today. And really, Acquia is a leader uh, when it comes to building a digital experience or building and, and really helping customers become successful with a digital experience platform. And really, one of the heritage uh, pillars of differentiation for Acquia really dates back and really, you know, get, gets to the founding of Drupal. Uh, and, and so our founder and CTO, Dries, who I believe uh, also has a session going on at this very moment talking about communities, uh, you know, he, he really has this, this vision, this, this philosophy around communities that I think is just fantastic. And, and I, I want to 
I want to figure out how we leverage more of that with the Modic going forward as well and be a much more active contributor to the community and really making sure that both Acquia's intentions, Acquia's roadmap, and, and the community are, are, are aligned moving forward. But again, you know, incredible heritage by Acquia in building, supporting, and 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 helping to drive value through communities. And, and so we want to continue on on that philosophy. You know. Acquia's marketing cloud really has three pillars uh, uh, today when you think about conceptually what we're trying to do. Um, the first is really knowing your customer. And in today's digital environment, you know your customer through the power of data. You know, how are they interacting with my website? How are they interacting with my campaigns? And, and you know, the, the, the emails, are they responding to it? Are they responding to the personalizations that I'm driving on the website? All of those as sources of data combined with their online offline transactions, you know, how they're interacting with various uh, uh, ad initiatives that I'm doing. All of this goes to building out that customer profile that ultimately allows me to, to really interact and service that customer in a way that makes sense to them. You know, the second is really helping customers build an experience that's really, you know, based on content. You know, I like to say content really is the heart of a digital experience. It's what persuades and convinces buyers. It's what persuades and convinces users uh, to be much more engaged uh, and really looking at data as the brains uh, of that overall digital experience platform. How do I build empathy? How do I engage authentically? Well, that combination of the heart of the digital experiences and the brains of digital experiences uh, is really two of those pillars. And then combined with really, you know, a lot of the power that uh, Modic and Campaign Studio, which I'll talk about in a second, bring is that intersection of content and data. How do I service that customer with, you know, engagement, outreach, and really one-to-one -one personalization by combining that content, by combining that data, and really scaling it up using process automation and more and more using machine learning as well. And so really, as I said, the three pillars, understanding your customer through data, building and deploying experiences with content, and then really driving one-to-one -one personalizations at scale, automation, machine learning, really as the drivers to that. And so at a high level, that's that's really the strategy and that's really what Acquia has been uh, building and really continue to build out as our really our corporate strategy. Um, Within that portfolio today, there are really two clouds. You know, first, uh, Drupal Cloud. And again, I mentioned Drupal is really the, the content cloud for Acquia. A number of great capabilities in there to help you build a site, manage a number of uh, large scale, uh, a number of sites or instances of sites, great tools for developers, great tools to migrate, and, and obviously a, a platform on which to host and elastically scale that platform. And then the other uh, a cloud being Acquia Marketing Cloud, um, which again has a number of capabilities when you think about customer data platforms, web personalization, um, digital asset management as well. And, and then the two that I've highlighted here, Campaign Studio and Campaign Factory. Uh, Campaign Studio, of course, really being Acquia's you know, implementation and deployment of, of Modic itself. So Campaign Studio, you know, when I talk about it here today, synonymous with Modic, basically. Um, we'll talk about how that's diverged a little bit and, and how we want to get back to, to really driving uh, an alignment with the community. Uh, but Campaign Studio, when you hear me talk about it, is going to be Modic. And then Campaign Factory is really, you know, a sister product, so to speak, to Campaign Studio. It really helps you take and manage instances at scale. So how do I do advanced cloning? How do I do you know, templating and copying between a, a large number of instances? You know, if you think about whether it's a franchise, whether it's more of a B to B to C type of customer deployment, um, you know, th those kind of capabilities really allow us to take that power of Modic and really manage it at scale. So that's what Campaign Factory is about. We really view them uh, as really, you know, almost two sides of, of the coin, which is really how do I do marketing automation at scale uh, as a core part of the Acquia Marketing Cloud today? You know, and, and really our focus is really going after enterprise customers. You know, companies like Johnson & Johnson, which you know have tremendous number of brands, tremendous number of sites, you know, tremendous number of instances deployed. You look at capabilities like Site Studio, potentially Campaign Factory as key capabilities that a company like Johnson & Johnson can leverage to really do their, you know, really do their marketing and do their site management at scale. 
Yeah. You know, Moderna, who's been, uh, you know, obviously in the market quite a bit today with, uh, you know, their, their vaccines uh, for COVID. You know, Moderna is a great example of an enterprise customer that needs to go quickly. You know, drug development, reactions to, to kind of these, uh, uh, you know, things like COVID, you know, disruptions and things that have been unforeseen requires them to have the tools and capabilities to go fast and scale quickly. And, and you know, very proud to call them a customer. Or companies like Lululemon that, you know, despite the downturn in retail, for example, Lululemon is doing tremendous and they're doing great because of that insights around customer data that they're able to leverage from, from Acquia's open DXP and then really drive their campaigns and, you know, their marketing solutions on the back of that. And so for us, it's really about going after those enterprise customers who have, you know, scale issues, you know, instance issues, elasticity issues, and really making sure that they have really the best platform on which to build and deploy those digital experiences at scale. And again, key part of our strategy and key part of how we're going to be bringing the products and the roadmap forward to really service, you know, that kind of archetypal customer model that we talk about there. And so, you know, along that journey, um, and, you know, I'll ask Julie to jump in here in a second as well. We, we've really seen, uh, uh, you know, we've, we've had an interesting journey towards the enterprise as well. And we kind of really wanted to share, you know, a number of the observations that we've seen and really use this as a springboard into talking a bit more about, you know, community alignment and, and community participation. You know, so Julie, I'll kick things off here and, you know, feel free to jump in in a second. I know you've been you've been even more deeply involved here than, than I have. Um, but, you know, the first one that I'll say is um, we're routinely and repeatedly beating or replacing uh, uh, solutions like Marketo and solutions like HubSpot. You know, and I, I was a developer long, long ago. I, I, you know, it's, I date myself if I've even told you the languages and, and tool sets that I've used way back in the day. But, you know, I remember as a, as a developer of the... The, the thing that got me most excited was seeing my tool, seeing my hard work basically being used and deployed at customer sites. And so when I see something like Modic or Campaign Studio really starting to displace, displace Marketo, displace HubSpot, you know, as a developer, as somebody who's part of the Modic community or part of Campaign Studio's development team, that's incredibly rewarding to know that that hard work, that effort is really turning into something. You know, on the on the Marketo side, you know, we've seen companies really look at a few areas, you know, obviously usability uh, of Marketo. Marketo was one of those earlier generations of marketing automation platforms. And I think what I've seen certainly in Marketo and the, even in my previous role, looking at what's happening on the Eloqua side, you know, companies realize they're paying for a lot of capabilities and they're only using a fraction of it. And they're also paying for the lack of usability or the lack of productivity that a number of those tools give you. You know, so certainly you get a lot of control and you get a lot of power, but that with that power comes a lot of just enablement challenges, onboarding challenges, and, and so forth. And so what we've really seen on the Marketo front is companies that, you know, are looking to invest in other marketing areas, other marketing technologies, such as AI, for example, and looking at ways that they can potentially reduce cost in that last generation of, of marketing technologies. So finding the right price point and then using that found money to start to reinvest into other marketing initiatives. And so, you know, great, great, great displacement strategy and something, you know, we continue to want to pursue. And then I think when you compare it to HubSpot, um, you know, it's a little bit of a different game. So we're, we're, we're beating HubSpot uh, and, and the feedback we tend to get is, you know, functionality wise, you know, HubSpot is, is pretty thin. And, and, you know, from a from a price performance perspective, they really see Modic as, you know, even if we offer it at, at a similar price as Marketo, they see the price to value ratio as just incredibly, you know, beneficial or, or positive towards Modic. You know, they they don't believe that that HubSpot is that is that thick of a solution or or that rich from a feature capability. It really is good for a uh, an SMB who just wants to get started with B two C type marketing, but for anything much more advanced than that, you know, they they really see the value prop of uh, of Modic as, as really beating it there. So, you know, for everybody in the community who's worked hard on it, or for for those of you who are out there, um, you know, deploying and and driving uh, marketing solutions uh, with your customers, I think you know. Another data point, I'm sure you're, you're seeing it as well, but some great data points of really beating best in class or what are perceived as best in class uh, options out there. You know, Modic, Modic is doing that today. And, and so it's incredibly exciting for me to see that. 
Julie, why don't you jump in? Why don't you uh, uh, talk a little bit around some of the items you're seeing? Sure. Yeah. So I'm actually going to speak to the next point. I think it, it relates well to what you said, Dia, in terms of replacing and being market owned HubSpot. So we are winning um, in large mid market enterprise solutions uh, for our customers, particularly across B2B, B2C, B2B2C. Um, the flexibility with our solution really attracts everyone from all those different target markets. What I'd like to do is give you a few examples of B2B, B2C, and B2B2C. Um, B2B and B2C, so for B2B, we currently have a customer that is working with private cloud solutions. Uh, what they're using Campaign Studio for is for lead generation. Um, and they found it very easy to use, um, you know, reaching out to their customers uh, or potential customers. And similarly for B2C, they're also using it for lead generation. So one particular use case is a customer that we have that has a parking application. For this parking application, they're looking for customers to use their app for garages, campuses, um, college campuses, um, airports, um, parking on the street. And so they're reaching out to these customers through lead generation using Campaign Studio, as well as cultivating that relationship with their customers to ensure that they come back to the application anytime they want to park in any of those different areas. Um, this is a very robust customer. They have uh, this application in over 1,000 cities across the entire world. So they're, um, they love using Campaign Studio for that. The next one I'd like to talk about is B2B2C. So we have several customers that fall under this category. Um, and as again, as Dan mentioned, these are customers who have seen Marketo and HubSpot and decide to come to Campaign Studio and Acquia in conjunction with Campaign Factory. So that's another huge factor for them. Um, so one example would be an automotive solutions company that, that is one of our customers and they essentially use it to scale very, very quickly, um, creating multiple instances, um, easily creating templates for emails, uh, templates for landing pages, um, and using our, our campaign creation. Um, and so using that, they're able to reach out to customers if they have uh, a lease that's up, for example. So they say, hey, we noticed that your lease is up. Would you like to come in and look at other cars? Or they may say, we've noticed that you need to service your car. Would you like to come in over the next month? Oh, and here, by the way, here's a coupon to encourage you, entice you to come in and get your car service. So there's lots of different use cases across the gamut um, who are using Campaign Studio across the mid-market, large mid-market, as well as enterprise customers. Yeah. And I, I think I'm sure many folks on the uh, the call might have seen some of the uh, the press and the news announcements, but Acquia is one of those customers. You know, Acquia, Acquia, those customers. <laughs> Acquia now uses, you know, Modic or Campaign Studio to really drive all of our marketing. So it's a great example of a B2B, you know, we're, we're probably more mid-market given our size than maybe enterprise, but it's a great example of a company that, you know, sees the value, you know, we're drinking, we're drinking the Modic champagne and, you know, being successful with it. So it's a great example of, uh, you know, an organization deriving value and really seeing the value of that and something we can, we can obviously speak to and have you know, our marketing team speak to as well. But I think we've recently published some assets and content that I'd encourage folks to uh, to check out as well that, that really speak to, you know, our journey uh, of replacing replacing Marketo and using, you know, using Modic, using Campaign Studio. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the next one actually to, in terms of Acquia using it, Acquia um, really enjoys the fact that Campaign Studio has a lot of different capabilities and that's really easy to use. Um, what I've found talking with customers out there who are using Campaign Studio is that they're really happy with the fact that it doesn't take months to get onboarded like it would with Marquetto. They can get onboarded within days, for example, or weeks. And that's a much more um, <clears throat> faster, um, it, basically, it's a, it's a faster return to, to their ROI. Um, so they find it very easy to use. In particular, what I've heard is that they really enjoy the campaign uh, creation. They like the drag and drop. They like that's very visual. Um, that's a huge differentiator when it comes to our other uh, competitors. They really, really enjoy the campaign aspect of it. In addition to that, they find that segmentation is also extremely easy to use. So those two things, I think, really make Campaign Studio stand out to our competitors. Um, and we'll continue, we'll continue improving on that so that it'll keep our customers happy. Yeah, no, I've seen the same thing. I mean, I think the productivity, ease of use, 
that really speaks to, you know, getting, getting stuff done, you know, do more with less and really simplifying that onboarding on ramping of new employees. I mean, all of those things really stand out as key differentiators. So, you know, great job on the usability front to, to the broad team here. And then, as you said, yeah, absolutely. The richness of capabilities. You see that with HubSpot all the time. When people compare Modic to, to HubSpot or Campaign Studio to HubSpot, you know, unless you have very simple requirements, you know, you, you people fall in love with journey building and, and, you know, that advanced campaign creation and so forth. And it really just really differentiates the product in that light, right. you know. You know, and I, I would say, you know, to, to move on to the next one, you know, I, I don't want to I don't want to say that it's all been an easy journey in some cases. You know, if I were to call out a few areas that that, you know, we've struggled, I'm sure the community has seen similar things. And, and you know, I, I see that from the sessions this morning as as well as the overall agenda. You know, the two areas that kind of stand out to me, at least. And again, I've been here a few months, so uh, I want to I want to caveat that to, to folks who've worked with Modic for much longer, you know, but I think overall scalability, particularly at the enterprise level, you know, so when you're dealing with, you know, large scale B2C, for example, we're running into companies that have 30, 50, 100 million plus profiles and a lot of events and transactions and so forth uh, uh, underneath the covers. And so scalability at that level, when you're dealing with 100 million plus profiles, has been a challenge and something that that you know we'll talk about a little bit in a second, uh, but but certainly an area that I think uh, continued investment and continued refinement and you know I'm very interested to to look at you know uh, I believe it was Josu and uh, Louise today I believe Louise's session is at three o'clock today their experience with scaling up as well so a great great opportunity for us to work much more closely with the community in some of those areas and, and then the team on our side have certainly spent a lot of time looking at areas to drive optimizations there as well. And then I would say the other one that I've seen quite a bit, and uh, I, I think we and the community have separate plans to address this. And so I wanna, I wanna make sure that we both get on the same track there, is really the, the trust and reliability of content creation. And in this case, you know, building emails or building landing pages. I, I think the old editors, uh, and I realize, you know, the community now is moving on to Grape. We, we have moved on to another email and we'll be doing landing page editors ourselves uh, early next year. Uh, but we have a forked plan there today. You know, we're both operating in, in, a, in a different go forward plan. Uh, but I think we're both trying to address the same sorts of, of issues, which is people are creating emails. People would create landing pages with the old editors. Uh, they would be corrupted. They would move around. And that creates, you know, a real trust issue uh, for, for organizations. You know, if they don't trust that what they're creating is going to be, you know, retained and durable, if they're dealing with frustrations of things just not being saved or things being corrupted, you know, you get that that weird emotional feeling when you're using the product that creates that fear of the unknown. You know, what's going to go wrong next? What's going to happen? Which customer is going to get the wrong content? And so, you know, trust in those areas becomes paramount to trust across the entire product as well. And so, um, as I said, we've been addressing it. I know the community has been addressing it as well. And I think over time, you know, figuring out how we start to align there or, you know, look at areas to make uh, uh, a multiple solution uh, more harmonious when it comes to things like test integration, for example, you know, is an area I want to make sure that we, we work together on. Um, another one that I'm really starting to see and uh, uh, is really that, that growing interest amongst marketers to be much more data driven. And so for us, and I'd be curious to see what other what other folks in the community are seeing, we're really seeing a strong demand for CDP type of integration, really driven by that you know post third party cookie world. Companies really want to deal with much more first party data. They, they're trying to figure out themselves how they're doing identity resolutions. They also want to leverage the power of machine learning to really drive that one to one personalization. Uh, um, you know whether it's and I'll talk more about these use cases in a second, but you know, even even sending emails at the right time that match that particular user is a great example of the kind of things you can do once you have a CDP in place. And so that's whole reaction to this, you know, post third party cookie world, marketers being much more data driven, investments in AI and ML, you know, in our world, that's leading to a lot more discussions around, you know, campaign studio or Modic in conjunction with CDP as an overall solution. You know, companies want to, you know, they really want to engage with customers. They want to maximize their ad spend and make sure they're getting a return on investment for that ad spend and, and really making sure they understand the customers to drive those personalizations. 
really is drivers behind it. And a lot of our roadmap is really focused on some of those pieces. And so I'll talk about that in a second as well. Um, so a few items I'm seeing. Julie, why don't you take the next one as well? I know we're both we're both seeing the, uh, you know, kind of the, the design and, and development implications of large teams coming in from an enterprise, not just scalability on the platform side, but scalability of teams, basically. Yeah, so enterprise customers have um, large team members. I think what's been surprising to me is, uh, well, taking a step back after talking to a few customers, you have the marketing team who's working with uh, marketing automation, and they may be anywhere from one people to anywhere from you know 100 people. Um, I've talking to folks kind of on the smaller side, but seeing Acquia uh, work with uh, Campaign Studio has really opened my eyes to enterprise customers and what they have to deal with. So for example, you have folks who are ca in campaign operations, you have marketing analytics, you have data analysts, as Dina had mentioned before, you have partner marketing. So you have all these different folks who are working um, and need to actually collaborate together in order to make marketing automation successful uh, for, for the particular company. So just to give an example of what I've seen recently for Acquia, they're working very closely with the sales team, for example. They're also working very closely with um, the events team in order to create you know, virtual events these days um, with, with um, Campaign Studio. So there's a lot of complexity there. There's a lot of collaboration. There's, there are a lot of folks who are in and out of Campaign Studio. Um, so, so having something that could uh, meet enterprise customers and making sure that they can all collaborate in a way that's easy and not difficult um, is something that uh, Campaign Studio is meeting and will continue to work on that to make sure that we meet those goals for our enterprise customers. I don't know, Dan, if you want to add more to that. Yeah, no, we, we see it sort of a, a few different areas, right? So the first, as you said, right, the, the teams might have designers separate from the people who are writing copy, who are separate from the managers who approve it, who are separate from the people who are doing, you know, the analytics and the ROI measurement. And so along the way, what you see is, you know, a need for more expansive templating and the ability to, you know, approve a template but then you know, only be able to change certain content. So that way your approval processes from a design side are separate than you know, copy editing and copy approvals, for example. Just workflows in general, where do things sit in the queue? Who's approved it? Who signed off on it? What's the workflow to approvals? All of those come into play a lot more as well. And then thinking about things like versioning uh, and version control management and so on, all of those things become much more important as well. So when you're dealing with small teams with one or two people, they figure out how to self-organize and self-assemble and get it done. When you're dealing with a team that have many different departments and you know a lot of complex workflow approvals and so forth, versioning, as I said, you know th these things become much more important. And I think great areas that both our roadmap and I think from a community perspective become great opportunities to continue to differentiate, evolve, uh, you know, the overall product offering. You know, and then finally for me, and I think uh, this this is something, and I've seen it throughout my career and just about every product I've mentioned, uh, you know, managed, uh, but, but the little things, you know, things that you don't think are that big often create the biggest pain when it comes to customer support and making sure the customers are successful. So when you think about scaling up an organization, it's these little things that often take the longest time to debug and resolve. You know, so, so examples uh, that we've seen recently, um, somebody is going to import a big list of contacts. Um, you know, maybe they've done syndication, maybe ha they have a new list of contacts they want to upload into the system and really start to drive email campaigns around. Well, oftentimes with those list loads, somewhere in the list, there's one row that has maybe an extra column or, you know, something got mixed up along the way and that, that file isn't perfect and, and the list load will fail. Why? You know, so user-friendly error messages. You know, we saw on row 1000 that this one ha had a missing column or had an extra column. You know, those kind of error messages, debug infos, you know, automatically skipping and resolving and just ignoring that one line, whatever the kind of, you know, little issues along the way we can encounter. And there's many of them. I'm using a simple example, of course, but there's all sorts of areas where those kind of processes can fail and fail silently or not give the user that, you know, an understanding of where to go next to debug their own issue. And that then turns into support cases, which turns into a much higher cost and a much higher delay, you know, for that particular customer to ultimately resolve it and become successful. We see the same thing on our side when it comes to doing things like just loading and syncing data with Salesforce. 
you know, seems like an easy problem, but it's not. And there's a lot of areas where from a usability perspective, from a sync rule perspective, all of these things can, can go, go awry with respect to how an organization handles leads, funnels them to a rep, uh, what the SLA is on, on making sure the things are loaded and synced and so forth, and the types of data that, that you want to sync. What are the overwrite rules between, you know, old record, new record, marketing attribution that I want to measure? Those areas that, that seem so simple, you know, it's easy for me to talk about big items like scalability, but it's those little issues at the, either the connector level or list import level that, that can often cause the biggest pain and the biggest frustration for a customer. And so making sure that user-friendly error messages, thinking, you know, thinking about the, the hardening and, and quality of the, the output connectors, for example, those, those all, all are great areas for both community involvement and areas that we, from a roadmap perspective, also want to make sure that we're, we're really focused on because they matter the most at the end of the day to the users. Yeah, I just want to add for, I know, Dion, you mentioned the Salesforce issue. One, one pain point that I realized that you know some team members have been going through is actually going through and checking to make sure it's syncing correctly. And that's something that we want um, to avoid happening, especially if we, we you know, with the syncing with the right, uh, old and new contacts um, that will help alleviate that pain point. Exactly, exactly. So, you know, I want to talk a little bit around where we're going next year. I mean, you got a bit of a background. You understand where where we're going from a go-to-market perspective and some of the big things we're investing in. Uh, I think two things, and, you know, I sort of divided this into things that, you know, I, I know we're going to share with the Mata community and things that I think together with the community, we need to work together on and figure out how best to approach some of this, especially since some of this will either have a, an embedded component that requires a license or potentially is using some of our other products that may be not open source. I still think there's avenues for us to collaborate and work together and make some of those items either pluggable uh, uh, or, or otherwise. You know, the first, you know, as we go up, up stack, to, to enterprise, as I said, we're really encountering, you know, B2B or B2C customers that are that are emailing tens of millions or even hundreds of millions of profiles, all with a large number of events and interactions along the way. And so enterprise scalability is, is really a big roadmap theme for us, both the end of this year and into 2021. You know, right now the the team have have developed you know anywhere from a three to five x, and we're in the process of benchmarking uh, and starting to take a closer look at you know what the ultimate business outcome is going to be on that. But we have a line of sight right now from anywhere to three to five x uh, uh, scalability improvement when you measure it against number of profiles and events. Uh, and, and then I think there's a number of work uh, in the second half of the year that we're looking at that I think could easily get us an uh, another two, three x performance improvement as well. And so really, we have a line of sight in 2021 to, to look at an order of magnitude, you know, scalability increase on the platform. And that really, when you think about it, you know, taking you from a few million profiles to tens of millions of profiles uh, as part of the easy path is kind of where we're going. Uh, and, and so I think that's hopefully very exciting for the community at large when you compare it or sort of you know, pair it with the, you know, the next item, which is we really want to make a concerted effort. And what I mean by concerted effort, I mean an invested, you know, resources uh, on our side that are going to be working to make sure that the campaign studio uh, source and, and the Mata community effectively becomes unforked. Now, I don't want to presuppose this is trivial. There are a few areas where we've diverged. You know, I think the email editor is a great example of that, where we've gone down the road of, of building and deploying the B editor, and there is a license fee on the back of that. Uh, I believe the community has gone down the road of looking at or of implementing Grape. And so, you know, there's going to be areas around the unforking with the community where we need to work closely together, figure out which ones, you know, is there a way to harmonize or is there, you know, more service pluggability interfaces we need to derive from that? Is there a way that we can do common test coverage across, you know, a, a, a mixed implementation side? But when you think about the core of the platform itself, we want to make sure that we're contributing that back to community and getting to a point where we're essentially unforked with the community so that our work and your work together, we can really help each other and overall amplify, you know, the, the benefits that's coming to Monic, you know, when you think about it at large. There's also a few other items, some of which may make aspects into the community, some may not. But again, an area where I want to work with the community, get your feedback and input as well. 
you know, connectors and list loads, you know, really bulletproofing things like the Salesforce sync, really making sure that we're putting a bunch of user-friendly error messages and things on things like the list loads, you know, improving overall usability and supportability around those particular issues is, is certainly one big area for us. We're also, and this is an area where I think Modic maybe is, is a little bit behind some of the competition, is really the depth and capabilities when it comes to reporting and analytics. And so we're integrating uh, with, you know, with our reporting and analytics solutions to really hopefully derive a bunch of new insights and, and scalability. Certainly that will, that will happen, but also putting out some new, uh, new reports and new metrics and new insights around how your campaigns are performing or how your marketing, uh, you know, campaigns are ultimately performing, looking at how, you know, it might stack up against a cohort. So being able to tag a cohort, you know, and start to drive comparative kind of analytics against how that overall cohort is performing, allowing companies that do much more interactive queries with the underlying uh, data layer itself, but through a, a, you know, much more controlled interface. And then, you know, moving the analytics layer on our side to something like a snowflake and really facilitating things like snowflake data sharing is also where we want to go as well. Again, great areas for us to collaborate and work together and figure out how analytics by and large can also be something where, you know, maybe today it's not a strength of Modic, but, but certainly something that we can work towards and make sure that even the baseline installation of Modic ha has much more uh, uh, increased capabilities and, and value add when it comes to the analytics and reporting side. You know, I mentioned this already, we're also going to be upgrading the landing page editor. You know, what we've seen, uh, and, and we've, we've undertaken the B upgrade on the email side. And the moment you do, and we have customers using it and, and playing with it now, you know, they, they, they see that and they compare it to the landing page editor and they say, well, I don't really want to enable my customers twice. You know, I want to have a single design metaphor and a single design philosophy. And once I've enabled the team, they can create content in both realms, but they also see the incredible richness, the trust that they're building with the new editor, and they want similar things on the landing page side as well. So we're going to be looking at doing this upgrade early in the new year. And then, you know, Julie mentioned more of the B to B to C go to market, which has been an incredible go to market for us. You know, we give customers a lot of control today on the campaign studio side. But when we think about campaign factory and managing those instances at scale, we want to give them much more control over, you know, the instance uh, permissioning uh, that the various users can use, along with a lot of branding and icon changes there as well. You know, the, the takeaway for this is not to, not to, you know, well, obviously some of this may not make it back to the community, but really to relay what I think is an incredible opportunity for Modic at large in that B2B to C go to market as well. So I think there could be incredible innovations and opportunities, um, you know, from the community to, to even take some of these items and run further with it when you think about a white labeling, embeddable OEM type of go to market as well. Um, Julie, before I move on, any any other items here that uh, you wanted to call out? Um, you know, I think this certainly covers the big big ticket items that we're talking about. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of you know what I'll describe as more pebble and and feature augmentation that I know you and the team are working on. Did it, did I miss anything? I think you have to cover most of it. I mean, it just reiterate that connectors on our side has been um, a big ask from a lot of our customers, especially the enterprise customers. And in terms of OEM white labeling, that's surfacing up as a big item as well, um, especially because they see the value of white labeling campaign studio and they want to do the same for campaign factory. Um, you know, they, they really like the, the same look and feel for those who are using the products. So. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so the other thing that I wanted to talk about, uh, because I think this is going to have implications to the downstream architecture and next, you know, the next, uh, uh, when you think about a major version, what we're doing on the marketing cloud side is really unifying all of the marketing cloud products into a, a single cohesive product. And what I mean by that is we want everything to run on a common layer of data and, and more and more that layer of data needs to be the CDP data layer. We also really want to wrap this inside of a unified user experience. And so that whether it comes to managing data or managing your campaigns or managing your web personalizations, that the teams of marketers really have, you know, what, what I see as a marketing command and control center to be able to do that. And so unified layer of data, unified user experience across the top of it. Obviously, Campaign Studio, Campaign Factory is a big part of that. You know, it's journey orchestration and so forth need to be, you know, kind of front and center basically into this new unified vision. 
But this is where we're going over over the course of 2021 is to bring bring all of those products together into a unified suite. Now, from a customer perspective, this is really going to allow us to you know both turn up the heat when it comes to analytics, you know some of the items I've talked about, but really also to apply machine learning at scale here. Uh, there's a few things we're already starting to do, and I think this is a, another area where you know, making Modic much more pluggable and not just, you know, aqueous solutions powering this, but if you wanted to use open source, you know, machine learning technology, if you wanted to use Apache Spark to do things like this, that that there's a way forward for the community as well. So some of the things we're doing just to, just to give more color to why we're doing it and some of the downstream benefits, you know, you can look at things like send time optimizations, which from a CDP perspective, we have already in place. And so what that means is, is that it's looking at the customer and really sending, you know, emails, for example, or, or doing engagement at a time that the customer will prefer or is most likely to open. You know, Ju Julie might be a night owl, you know, getting her with an email at 9 p.m., for example, is much more likely to get an open and a response than me. You know, I turn into a pumpkin at around 8.30. I'm in bed early because I'm up early. You know, you get me with an email at 6.30 a.m. when I'm having my coffee much more likely to respond, much more likely to engage. So CDP can make those predictions today. What we also want to do is that within Campaign Studio, when you decide to execute a campaign, there's simply a checkbox that says optimize send times. So rather than trying to send them as one big batch, Campaign Studio will use those predicted times that the data layer is surfacing and automatically send those for each profile based on their preferred time. So incredible usability in that it's a simple checkbox tied to a campaign, incredible surfacing of data throughout that entire uh, journey, and then ultimately driving hopefully a higher ROI that we'll be able to measure as part of the overall analytics and reporting solution. So you can see how things like machine learning is really helping you drive that deeper level of engagement or deeper level of marketing ROI. There's a few other uh, examples here. I won't go deep into it, but looking at things like frequency optimization. How do I know, how, how often is too often to send to a particular customer? I probably like a weekly digest. Julie might like getting 10 emails a day. You know, how do I optimize campaigns, you know, to really look at that frequency optimization and how do I how do I really build a campaign that takes advantage of that and at the same time making sure that all of my other campaigns that may hit those same users get prioritized and orchestrated accordingly to fall within these frequency optimization recommendations. And so there's an incredible amount of research the team is doing on this. From a machine learning perspective, we're going to have this in place by Q1. But from a campaign studio automation perspective, we're still looking at some of the designs and things around that as well. But incredible, incredibly exciting capability. Channel optimization is the same thing. You know, are, is, is Julie much more likely to engage on Facebook than, than I am, absolutely. Don't even have a Facebook account. You know, if I did, I still probably wouldn't engage there because I'd go there once a month. You know, getting me on LinkedIn, on the other hand, you'll probably see me even faster than you will on email because I, you know, batch email, uh, you know, once a day, I get LinkedIn notifications all the time. So understanding the right channel, understanding the right time, understanding the right frequency, and, and me, being able to allow the marketer to ignore all that and just have the right things happen is where we want to go. So how do we leapfrog the competition when it comes to the application of machine learning? And then we're also going to be doing a whole bunch of other models that marketers will be able to take advantage of. You know, if I know uh, a customer, if I know uh, a given a, a set of customers, maybe who have a high propensity to buy with a 10% discount, I can build a marketing campaign that's really targeted to that set of customers. So before I get to my 25% discounts, let me get the people who are going to engage at a 10% discount first, for example. Or if I know what a predicted lifetime value of a customer is, I can do offerings that are much more loss leader centric because I know it's going to drive engagement and stickiness of that customer. Or looking at companies that are looking at users or, or organizations that have maybe not visited my site in the last six months and really doing abandoned browse campaigns automatically, potentially, um, you know, depending on the usability uh, designs and so forth, that really allow me to drive retention and re-engagement, something I know a lot of marketers are focused on, particularly during COVID as they try to optimize their, their spend to drive customer retention and customer loyalty. And so this is why we're really driving that integration is because we feel there's an opportunity to one, harness the power of data and, and to really look at you know, these high level of productivity uh, uh, you know, kind of innovations that we can put in the hands of the marketer 
to, to allow them to get the highest ROI uh, and have the system try to optimatic, you know, uh, optimize that for them automatically. Now, that's going to mean a few things downstream. I think what this really means from a community perspective, and, and this is really where, again, great opportunity to collaborate together. I'd love to get you know, input as well, is that we need, really need to move Modic from a monolith or a monolith architectural design to a much more, I'll call it microservice design, although for those of you out there in the audience who are microservice purists, uh, I don't know that we have to follow that design pattern to a T. I'm not sure everything needs its own database, for example, but in any case, let's not get into a, a religious war here. I think at the end of the day, what it really means is moving this to an N-tiered or, or decoupled architecture where really APIs are powering everything and we have the opportunity to plug things in, drive extensibility, either drive replacements at, at a UX or a data tier level at an analytics level and, and really drive that that next gen architecture that is going to lead to that extensibility decoupling elasticity from a scale perspective and and so on and so again this is why i'm so interested in, in making sure that we're aligned with the community because i think this is this really forms in my mind the next generation architecture of where modic needs to go and i, I really love the community to you know come along for that ride and let's take it together so we're all operating on a same code base and, and really doing things that we both benefit from for the next five to 10 years, basically. And so super excited about where that's gonna lead us. And our team is already starting to look at, you know, what that might look like from an architectural perspective. What are the areas that we will need to change? What kind of API designs do we need to propose and so forth? And again, love to get more involvement on that one. You know, so so I think this is a good spot, you know, Julie, maybe for me to turn it over to you. We have a couple of items that I think, you know, uh, I think would be good for the community to get involved. And, you know, we wanted to put some time in place to further this discussion. So so why don't you talk us through that? Sure. So I have this divided to three different categories, continue as in, you know, continue doing what we're doing now, upcoming, what our plans are uh, in the future at Acquia and what we could do with the community and then future state, which is things that we're considering, but haven't quite made it to the roadmap yet, but we can have conversations with the community on that as we develop those future uh, solutions. So in terms of continuing, I know the community as well as Acquia is uh, really building up and making our test case coverage more robust and using Cypress to do that. So we want to continue working with the community on that. Um, if there are any questions, you know, feel free to reach out to me or any of the developers on our engineering team. In terms of upcoming, one thing that we're, we are also uh, considering and is also very much on our radar is the Symphony upgrade to version 4.4 to from our current version, which is uh, reaching end of life in terms of uh, fixing bugs at November of next year. So what our goal is to uh, upgrade to version 4.4 um, by May of next year so that it could meet the, the release, the major release in the community. And we would like to work with the community on that. Uh, we actually, the good news is we actually have a good working version of this right now. Um, you know, I'm sure there are a few bugs in there that we would want to fix. And so we want to work with the community on that to make sure that is as uh, robust as possible and that it's meeting all of our criteria before we move forward. So the next one is performance and scaling improvements. I know Deanna had mentioned there are two talks today that really, uh, speak to this particular subject area. And that's something, of course, that we're also looking to do as well, um, ensuring that if we reach a high number of contacts, for example, that we don't run into any performance issues with our pages, that there aren't slow load times, that our reports are working and uh, loading in a in acceptable manner. Um, so we want to work with the community on that to make sure that it's uh, as uh, acceptable for our customers. Um, actually, I wouldn't say acceptable. It's It's what our customers expect from our product. So delightful. I don't know if you have anything to add to that. It looks like you're right. <laughs> yeah, no, no, we want it to be delightful. I mean, delightful. The end of the day, yes, right? that's it, what we for. <laughs> an overused word, but I still like it. Yes. <laughs> and then in terms of future improvements, uh, Ferola is something that's come up uh, quite frequently more recently for me. So we have the Ferola replacement. I know the WYSIWYG that we're using within the email builder landing page uh, in the future is a different WYSIWYG. Uh, Ferola has not been updated in a few years uh, because of our license. And pretty soon, I think we should look into replacing that. 
in addition to that, I've spoken to a few customers who have found Pharrell to be relatively limiting. Um, for example, they couldn't get the exact colors that they need. And to our customers, branding is everything. If they can't get the correct colors, then um, it's not going to work for them. So being able to put in hex codes, for example, is something that is a feature that we should consider in our next week's wig. Um, so that's something that we should look into. Uh, surface re service refactoring is something that Deanna had mentioned in the previous slide. Um, making sure that you know it's API first, uh, making sure that um, it, it fits in with the model that Deanna had described in the previous slide. The next thing is GDPR compliance, uh, additional features and also additional features related to that in the Preference Center. Uh, I know within the community, there has been some um, uh, GDPR features that have already been built out. So we want to build upon that, build on top of that. Uh, one thing that I know Ruth had mentioned was creating a GDPR dashboard. Um, on our side, it's just making sure that some of those features, again, are more robust. Uh, example of that would be within the Preference Center, making sure that you can unsubscribe to more than one email for example, one email, um, uh, if you're subscribed to multiple emails, being able to unsubscribe to all those emails all at once. So that's one, one example. Another example would be to, um, if a customer and user want to receive emails in different, different channels or alerts in different channels to be able to do that as well. Um, so those are some things that we should also consider. And lastly, user-friendly error detection messages. That's something that Dia had mentioned several times already. Um, we want to make sure that people are able to uh, look at these different error messages and be able to take action on them versus coming into Acquia or going to the community and asking for uh, help to figure out what the next steps are. Awesome. And, uh... and this is the last slide that we have. Um, so community office hours, uh, Chaz Adams, uh, a product owner at uh, Acquia, who's working on Campaign Studio and Campaign Factory and has worked with the community as well. He joined several months ago. We're happy to have him. But Chaz and I are uh, will have office hours uh, at the first Tuesday of every month starting next month. So the first, uh, actually, I don't December, the first Tuesday in December will be our first office hours from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. Eastern time. Um, I include the Zoom link right there. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to join. We'll talk about um, anything related to Acquia or the community that you have questions on, strategic alignment, what we have in our roadmap, um, any other issues or questions that you may have, feel free to jump on and we'll be there to answer any questions that you have. Yeah, no, that's awesome. And I'll be there as well. And, and you know, again, I hope uh, for, for those of you in the community, either on whether it's the marketing side or on the development side, you know, come in and, uh, you know, let us know. Uh, let's have those discussions. Let's debate approaches, architecture, whatever it makes sense. Uh, and, uh, you know, obviously, if we don't have the right ones, we'll, we'll make sure that the, uh, the right members of the team um, you know, follow up based on, you know, the, the meeting over meeting uh, follow ups and agenda items. So, uh, you know, looking forward to getting this started and really, you know, demonstrating that commitment to the community and, and our resolve to kind of unfork and work together on, on some of those items. So, you know, a little bit more, uh, you know, I was hoping to only take a half hour here. I'm sorry, I'm long winded. I, 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 uh, I seem to take more time just to present my name sometimes than I'm allotted. So my apologies to everybody, but, but Ruben, if you're still out there, you know, if there's any questions or anything, you know, happy to, uh, happy to, uh, you know, try to answer them as best we can, or to certainly take the actions and do some follow-up here. I, I hear. Hey, Ruben. Thank you for your presentation. Really interesting. Really looking forward to see this uh, new editor coming. It's something that, that a lot of people is demanding, right? Awesome. Okay, we have a few minutes and a few questions, okay? Let's go through them quickly. So first question is from Indoor. He says that what is the difference between Campaign Studio and Mautic uh, the community, meaning features versus other capabilities, or is there any difference between Akia Campaign Studio or the Mautic Community Edition in terms of features or? Yes, yeah, so, I mean, Julie, you're probably better to answer this. I mean, at a high level, as I said, we've, we've, we've obviously built Campaign Studio off of Mautic. Uh, but I think there's been a few areas along the way that we've diverged, um, you know, whether it's, you know, bug fixes and other things that maybe have not gotten fully contributed back to the community, custom endpoints and activations. Um, you look at things like the fact that the community now has the grape 
editor for emails. We have the B free editor for emails. You know, we, we've started, we, we were aligned and we're starting to fork. And, and, you know, we need to make sure that our code base gets back in and gets back in line so that we're all operating so that, you know, if we upgrade Symphony, you don't have to do it separately. So I would say there's not a big, a big uh, disparity. We've done optimizations and additions and things, but we want to, as much as possible, um, you know, get the core code base back aligned so that, again, we're all operating and can all amplify each other's work on both the maintenance level, as well as these things like secu uh, scalability, security, and so forth. You know, our addition may always contain different endpoints, different connectors, maybe different analytics items that we OEM and, and you know, the community don't want to pay that license. So I'd imagine there's always going to be value adds but we want those to be pluggable, not a fork code base. And that's where we need to get back uh, get back aligned around. Yeah, two other things I would add is custom objects is something that's coming up in our roadmap that that's something that would differentiate um, our product in that will not be uh, in the community version. And the second thing is uh, not really product related, but more sort of service related. Um, that's something that we've heard as well as, you know, we include service for our products as well as being able to um, scale a little bit more quickly yeah that's actually you know what the community is concerned about okay is there gonna be any proprietary solution included in the code base something that is gonna limit you know so i, I agree that it's gonna be more flexible to you know unfold and you know get your conditions back into the project and then you know the community will also benefit the project with their own add-ons and so on cool that's right Another question from Inder as well is also also in the future the new features and hasten whatever Akia campaign studio builds will it be available for community edition also so it's more or less the same question probably same answer right yeah and and I think that you know the answer just to be clear is that uh, in some cases yes we're going to commit it all back to the community uh, in some cases no some of these are going to be value added add-ons and, and that might be just simply if it's part of our monetization strategy. But also more importantly, you know, we're, we're, we do things like embed Looker as our analytics solution and, and we have to pay royalties on some of those items. And so our ability to simply contribute that back to the community may not be as easy just due to contractual or licensing limitations. But we want to try to get to a point where if we do have divergences or if we do have add-ons and, and capabilities that aren't part of the community, that we do so in a way that it's still a common code base and these things are still pluggable. And that's just a pathway. If somebody wants to be, you know, Modic and go to Campaign Studio, they have an option to do it. If they have Campaign Studio and want to go back to Modic, they also have a way to do it. They may lose some of those additional add-ons and capabilities, but you know, their, their assets, their journeys, all of those things should be common. So, so the answer is that it's a bit mixed and that's, that's largely a commercial discussion, but we want the core to be shared. Makes sense. Cool. And then one last question that is sneaking a few seconds ago from Jose Comenares. Uh, is any further integration between Drupal and Maori? I can ask, I, I can answer that, but I guess <laughs> you can't do it. You know, as, so as I said, I'm here three months. The, the idea of being much more aligned with Drupal is something that I'm personally enamored with. I think there's an incredible opportunity there. And I, I use the abandoned browse uh, uh, example here, right? If you have a Drupal website up and running, you got a whole bunch of people coming in and visiting that site all the time. Some of them anonymous, some of them getting resolved to known. If I can capture that data, then I can automatically, and, and doing that with the CDP, I can automatically start to make recommendations around campaigns like, this is a set of customers that visited your site greater than three months ago. I've automatically created a campaign for you so that all you need to do is fill in the email template and it has maybe digest of, of key content, you click the send button and those customers are, are hopefully getting re-engaged with your brand, getting a message digest, really starting to come back if they've been abandoned for the last number of months as a way of continuing to drive customer engagement. So I think, I think it's an incredibly ripe opportunity. I think there's incredible opportunities we can do to drive automation and integration and collection of data and so forth. Uh, and, and we're really, you know, for me, I'm just starting to look at it. But yes, I think it's the short answer. What that looks like, it's a bit too early for me to say. Exactly, that's the that's answer. Really, really good integration. We did really wonderful things, you know, between Drupal and Mautic. And I'm really happy that Akia took the, you know, the, the decision of acquiring Mautic. And I guess it's in the road. It, it's in the, in the, the good road. Cool. Okay, no more questions. 
We did it on time. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Dion. Again. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, and I hope to see so, you at our first monthly meeting. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. Looking forward for the office hours. Uh, probably <laughs> excellent. Exactly. Cool. All right. Thank, thanks, everybody. Thank hey, you. Bye. Enjoy the rest of uh, Multicom. Thank you. Thanks. Cheers. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.